welcome to, to Moments with Melinda. And my guest today is Diane Gare. How are you? I'm fine. I'm glad to be here. I am so glad to have you here. You and I go back many, many years. I think 30 or 40 years we go back and we've sort of been aligning in each other's careers. And I have been dying to learn more about you and to share with my viewers your life story. So for my viewers, let me tell you a little bit about Diane Gare. She is an architect, an environmentally conscious designer, a teacher, an artist, and a writer. Anything you'd like to add to that illustrious list of accomplishments? Mm. I guess that will, that will hold for now. <laughs> and, yes, and you are a visionary, but we're going to get- I aspire in. to be a troublemaker, but I don't think people know that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think they know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 I do. I think, I, think, I think people have, I think you have impacted people and certainly in my work, in sustainable redevelopment, you were always there as sort of the conscious in the back tapping me on the shoulder and saying, Melinda, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? And you've always stretched me to think a lot deeper in the work that I was doing. And I think that's been, you know, one of your roles um, is that you are, you are someone who does not hold back if you know that something could be done better to protect our planet. So mm -hmm. I think, I think I, I've always loved that about you. You do not, you aren't, you are not a, um, a um, wilting flower. You are a explosive energy of what's right and good. And your trouble is good, good trouble. Okay. Like John Lewis said. So let's start with you sharing with us a little bit about your life and your childhood and, um, and where you grew up and a little bit about that. Well, I guess I would start by saying I didn't grow up in the US. I grew up in Switzerland in French speaking part in Geneva and came to the US at age 14 with American parents. So that gives me a little bit of an outsider viewpoint at some times. And I think that's added to my architecture that's added to my worldview of how to solve problems. Um, but uh, it was a very urban but small place. So coming to Burlington sort of met a lot of those childhood pieces of having an urban context, but it was still small. Um, and I don't know um, what all to say. Um, arriving at age 14, I went from being able to access the whole city on buses, on bikes, on walking. It was safe. And then I landed in sort of a suburban rural part of Pennsylvania where I rode the yellow school bus for the first time. Um, so my world as a pre-teenager, teenager, went, instead of expanding, contracted. And I, I, I um, find that interesting in retrospect in terms of, of how that informed some of the ways I see and work. Um, yeah. So you came from Switzerland where yeah. you were born and you lived and at 14, you moved to the States and lived where in Pennsylvania? Well, it, it's not a famous part of my life, so I don't tend to talk about it. Well, I'm from Pennsylvania, so that's why oh, I'm right. asking. Yeah. Oh, right. Um, so it was a mountain outside of Valley Forge. It was called Valley Forge Mountain. Okay. And um it did form a couple different things, but I think one of the, um, oh, and you know, when kids change schools and change cultures, all sorts of things happen. Um, but the first two years that I was there, I pretty much isolated myself. And um, I think because of that, it informs my belief system in, in myself. I, I am very strong internally because I depended on myself for two years. Um, and I know some people have, have different experiences out of that, but for me, it was very powerful. Well, you also are a deep thinker and 14 is a, is a difficult time to be thrown into a new, you're going through a lot of stuff anyway at 14. And so to be thrown mm -hmm. into a new environment. So um, can you share a little bit about who had the most influence on your life um, and your career? Mm. Hmm. Maybe a, a litany, a collection of, of friends and people. Um, there's not 
one particular person that stands out, although um, um, there was a course when I was in high school, I did end up in a, in a Waldorf school that's um, sort of Rudolf Steiner philosophy. And there was a course called um, History Through Architecture. And in that course, we explored the meaning of space and um, sort of modulating their three like nested envelopes about space, personal space, community space, and cosmic space. And um, that in particular, not only influenced my life personally and my work in the community, but also um, my belief system in terms of being part of the cosmos. So that's, that's critical. And it was more a course following Rudolf Steiner than, than a person in particular. Mm -hmm. um, and then sort of unfolding at the same time, I had a couple siblings of friends who were studying architecture, um, one of whom was a woman who's now deceased. And um, so I knew right from the beginning that architecture was a possibility, as well as my father's an engineer, was an engineer, my brother was an engineer. So it ran in the family. Um, and where I didn't quite want to do what they were doing, I could go from engineering to architecture. And my father totally supported that from the get go. I said, teaching or architecture? And he said, go for it. I'll get you in tomorrow. So I would say my father was also a huge influence, as was my mother. I come from a long line of very educated women. Both my grandmothers from both sides were educated. Um, my paternal grandmother was in the extension service in Nebraska. And I was totally surprised when I went to visit with the archives so several years ago that th that, that was unusual. They were like, wait, we want her history too, because they didn't, they said, no, extension service was always men. I'm going, what do you mean? It's always been women to me. And, um, and my mother and, and my grandmother were um, also early in banking. Um, so so there, I'd have to say, you know, strength of families in there, as well as sort of friends along the way. So, so share with us a little bit about your journey from Pennsylvania um, mm. to, to Burlington, to Vermont. So Pennsylvania was the high school mm, four or five years. And in 1971, um, my parents picked up and said, okay, that's it. We're going back out West because they'd started out West and landed in Colorado. Um, I ended up not in architecture school, but a liberal arts school in, in um, California called Carleton University. And the way I like to say it is even Obama didn't like it there because <laughs> he went to Carleton uh, maybe he graduated. I left. Um, <clears throat> so I went to Carl, um, sorry, I went to um, Occidental College, and then I went to the University of Colorado, and then I spent a year in Germany, and then I came back. So I went to five school, or two schools twice, um, three schools total, and graduated in four years. Wow. And then I went off and taught skiing. Right? Isn't that what we did in the seventies? Yes, we did. I guess yeah. we did. Yeah, I was skiing. I was teaching skiing at Mad River. I guess we did. We did. And so, so you now you you and your ex husband was he was your business partner. You established your own practice yes. called Artemis Design. Art yes. is it Art Artemis Design or Artemis Design? Tell us a little bit about your time in Colorado and the important work you did while you were there. Okay, so. Um, to segue back just a little bit. So I end up in Colorado teaching skiing, um, three part-time jobs. That's when I come home and I say, this isn't sustainable. I need to do something else. At six in the morning, scraping sugar off of donut racks was not going to be my future. So I end up in architecture school. I meet Jeff in architecture school. Um, we graduate um, and we decide uh, well, I work for a couple um, other architects for a couple for a year and a half, and then um, we become part of the. Uh, <clears throat> it was a HUD renovation zone in um, Denver, and so we buy a building, 
we start to renovate it. There's a fire in it. And there have been fires in several of my key iconic projects, as it turns out. Jumping ahead, Old Mill had a history of fire in it before that became my key project at UVM. <clears throat> So on Santa Fe Drive, Jeff and I op opus Artemis Designs, and the fire is the day that I quit my paying job. And the building burns down to the degree that then all the code violations kick in that we have to take care of, as opposed to just thinking we're doing a simple renovation, the whole thing has to be brought up to code. And I think you might know what some of that means. <laughs> So, so that's the beginning of Artemis Designs. I basically named it after my own name. Artemis was the goddess of the hunt, the Greek goddess. Um, um, and I'm, I become the one that's licensed. I'm sort of in charge of the office and um, Jeff and I work together and he does the renovations part more than I do. And um, it's sort of a split office. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But after several years of that, the economy in Denver totally falls apart and it continues to fall apart for a total of eight to nine years. So at year five, I'm applying for jobs elsewhere and one of the places is UVM. Um, and, and, I, and I keep track of the eight years because it wasn't like, oh yeah, I could just go work for UVM for six months or a year and then go back the economy continued to uh, be non-existent. Um, so I end up at UVM and it's, it's a total love. I fall in love with Vermont. I fall in love with the work that I'm doing. I'm finally getting paid. I mean, all things are good, except I did leave a life behind in Colorado and that was okay too. Well, we're so glad that you um, came to Vermont. Well, Vermont ends up being, and I came, the first visit was in November after Thanksgiving, frozen ground, by the lake, dark. I, it, what year was that, Diane? What year was that? It was November 1988, or I moved in 88, so maybe it was 87. Um, I totally fell in love. I said, this is it. The, the smell of the earth um, in that frozen November night did it. And that's probably not what more, most people say. Well, The Smell of the Earth, I think that should be a book. And I know you've written a couple of books. We're going to talk about that. But I think your next book should be called The Smell of the Earth. Oh, cool. Uh, because well, I, agree, I, I agree with you. There, there's, there's something about the smell of the earth. If it smells right, it's a great place to be. Um, so talk to us a little bit about your work as an educator, because you were at Norwich University, the University of Vermont, and the Yes Tomorrow Design Build School in Waitsville. Talk mm -hmm. a little bit about the work you did as an educator. Um, so it evolves out of working for UVM for five years. And I think, um, well, there was somebody teaching an architecture course within what was then still VoTech, and they stopped doing that. And so I am asked to step in and fill in. And um, that meets a need in, in what I like to do and, and expands from doing drawings to helping other people see the world and know that they can make a difference. Um, so that's the um, engagement and teaching is, is that, and what I found at UVM versus Norwich is that I could teach drawing and design skills to environmental students or natural resource students at UVM so that they had more tools where if I was at Norwich, um, they were already thinking that they were architects and, and they didn't want to learn maybe about the environment. And what I've always been doing is mating the environment, that place where we live, with um, how we engage in it. And that's the architecture for me. Now, so I, okay, go ahead. two come together. Well, I also want to say that, that you also had your students mm -hmm. work on projects and okay. actually design important parts of the city. Talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the way to sort of help them manifest their voices was to take on various design projects. Barge Canal, for one. Um, the Waterfront, for another. Um, but it also involved projects in like Middlesex, 
or um, St. Johnsbury. Um, so having students engaged, and at this point, then I'm also um, director of the Vermont Design Institute, which was a nonprofit that did this kind of work, um, nonprofit work of helping towns or nonprofits um, engage in design and planning around sustainable issues and giving them the resources that maybe their volunteer staff didn't have. One of the projects that I really like, and we can always come back to, um, to Wadesfield, but um, St. Johnsbury was a key early Vermont design project. And it was when Preservation Trust also still had um, runners, road runners, what are the, um, when we used to have journeymen travel from town to town with the news, that kind of thing. Right. Anyway, Steve Libby was, was one of these um, folks for the Preservation Trust of Vermont. And together we created a team for the, um, for the St. Johnsbury Athenaeum. And they were very worried because the courthouse was being reconstructed and everyone was talking about the parking problem in the town and the courthouse wanted to build a five-story parking garage behind the town offices that would have dwarfed the Athenaeum. And so through an, a process of meetings with locals and Pi Socials started at that point, we engaged neighbors and um, folks who lived in St. Johnsbury and asked them about their parking habits, all of which ended up showing that there was a really easy non-build solution. So the state was happy with us, the Athenaeum was happy with us, the parking needs were solved and we didn't build anything. So uh -huh. no natural resources were used. What it really amounted to was re-measuring all the parking meters so that people at the courthouse could park for six to eight hours and people at the post office would have 15 minutes. And it was just a flip of all the hours on all the meters. And then there was plenty of parking. So that, and that was also in the time that the Rutland parking structure was controversial. So that, to me, that was a win-win. We didn't have to spend $5 million of concrete and we didn't ruin the Ath Athenaeum. But that's long ago. That was like over 30 years ago. <clears throat> and you've been doing this work for so long. So now you, you, so you just mentioned that you were the director of the Vermont Design Institute. And mm -hmm. I was going to, that was going to be one of my questions, but you are committed to and have devoted your life's work to ensuring that architecture creates a more sustainable future through community empowerment and mm -hmm. integrative design approaches. Can you share with our viewers what that means and, mm. and maybe bring in some of the projects where you've done that. <laughs> Excuse me. So it ranges. It ranges from the Athenaeum project, which was a no-build project. Um, the, the building that Jeff and I invested in, which was a HUD neighborhood target zone that had been redlined and um, no one could get loans for those buildings. And so it took you know, physical engagement, direct involvement to make a change on those neighborhoods. And in that case, I, I wasn't only working on our own building, but I was part of a community coalition that helped neighbors gain $1,000 for a facade renovation. And with that facade renovation, the neighborhood um, streetscape would change and get bus stops, benches, street trees, um, and new sidewalks. So that's sort of the very urban scale. Um, and I think in between is the smaller projects that, um, you know, an example would be participating and teaching with Yestermora where there was a band of us that did, um, hands-on projects within civic um, realms. Mm -hmm. um, I went to Ball State with a team of folks, I think two years in a row, and we did a shelter along the river one year with the students. And um, another part of that was um, for a, 
um, the high schools were building small houses for folks for um, like a habitat house, for example, and we were doing a carport. Um, so that's a very direct hands-on um, in the building as opposed to sort of community um, engagement, which the Santa Fe project is. So, so, um, so, so I want to, because we're, we're getting, yeah. so I, I have some, I could talk to you for hours and there's, and of course this is a world that I'm just so in love with. Um, talk, talk to me a little bit about, um, about what you are working on now. And I want to move on to the green Tara because you, 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 you uh, stopped working at the nonprofit as a director in 2016. And so yeah, that's a while, that's a while ago, six years ago. And I've been up to Green Tara. So who is Green Tara? And share with us the community that you have created in North Hero that's named after her. So Green Tara, let's see, maybe I bought that building in 2017. So it, it flows that there I am going back and forth to North Hero because we have a cabin there and I'm watching a building fall down for seven years. So I keep saying, well, somebody needs to buy the building. and you know nobody's buying it so i buy it <laughs> so that's the beginning and it's a 200 year old structure so of course you know there's there's a lot of sacredness in the structure plus of course it was a catholic church initially no sorry initially it was a general store so i like the fact that it started as a general store then it became a church and now it's sort of an art and community gallery <clears throat> um when it opened and it was as I was working on it and I was working alongside the builders, um, it was very clear it needed to be big open space because that's what it was. I mean, it's not a huge building. Um, so that led it to being an art gallery and I managed a, a sort of coffee and tea bar. And then under COVID, it became the tasting room for a microbrewery and they're now moving out. So next year, year seven, it's undergoing its own transformation. And we'll see, we'll see where the snakes lead us. Um, you know, I opened the water heater the other day and there was the fattest snake I've ever seen in the water heater. That's a blessing. So warm. That's a blessing. I so, know. So can you tell our viewers where they can find the green Tara? Um, so in the village of North Hero, it's pretty much only open on weekends and right now through October. Um, Kramer and Ken move out before Halloween. So it's only open until then, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, noon to six. There is a temporary, I've been curating the shows, but we got to the end of the <clears throat> set curated shows. Janet Van Fleet's work just came down. So I pulled out of my archives, you'll like this, um, old ecological drawings that students made from 2016. So those are now pinned on the wall as little transformative drawings. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. So Diane, what, what is your vision for the future of our species as we experience the tragic effects of human inability to deal with climate change and protect our planet for future generations? Um, how much time do I have left? Well, we, only, well, we have about five minutes, but you know, you, I mean, you have been doing this your whole life. I mean, you've been thinking about this and everything that you've touched. And so here we are, uh, you know, witnessing what's happening down in Florida and even in our own world here in Vermont. Um, and I'm just would love to hear the, from you, your wisdom on the future of our species. And, um, so go for it, girlfriend. Yeah. So I have both, uh, a short-term view and a long-term view. And it, the, the middle ground view is the one that's the most difficult that we always ask the question to. The, the first part is I went back to 1967 and I'm reading the territorial imperative. And I'm shocked as to how few people that I know in my circle know about these three books that he wrote. Um, and I'm gleaning so much about this territorial imperative to sort of in, inform my questioning about what's going on um, in all the migrations, in all the wars, in all the tragedies that are unfolding with our nation states. Um, so, so it's sort of anchoring me um, in a way. So, I mean, I'm not angry. I mean, this is human nature. 
um <clears throat> what 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 um i think when i breathe deeply it's just um so much more than our day-to-day -day experience i mean i'm 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 lucky i'm i'm in a good place and i know not everybody has that but the ultimate reality that's behind all of this is eternal and free and pure. And, and that's sort of where I go to to remind myself that it's okay. There's more to it than, than, than the hurricane hitting Florida. That's devastating. I'm not denying that. But at the same time, there's, there's a whole bigger, bigger, bigger world out there um, that's not a man-made world. And I think that's my connection um, that, that's beyond our, our community space to the cosmic space that, that um, gives me hope. And, and, you know, you either have faith or you don't. And um, it's hard. It is, it is hard. And, and I, think, <clears throat> I think this, this bodes for you to maybe start a podcast in some way that could educate people to, mm -hmm. to think this way, because it is horrific and the suffering is, is beyond belief. And at the end of the day, I think people do need to to be able to look at this maybe in the way that you are. So thank you for that. Now, what words of wisdom would you want to share with our younger generation? Well, I've come back to meditation as a serious um, endeavor where in my 20s, I did a lot of Zen Buddhism and meditation. And then in the, I guess, in my 40s, and sort of get very busy with, with my worldly life. And then I come back to it. And I would say um, spending time meditating is worth every ounce you put into it. And um, um, the, that that would be something um, that I would suggest to, to anybody, um, but young people in particular. Mm -hmm. um, finding where the, the depth is and not being afraid. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to tell somebody not to be afraid. There's so much to be afraid about. And yet it is sort of a choice. You can choose to not be afraid. Like you can choose to be happy. Right. And 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 that and that's easy for us to be happy. I mean, we're in Vermont, we're um so this is a whole different different um interview with you, but I think that young people and I have um young grandchildren and I hear them all the time that this is the world they're growing up in and where will their species be in 30, 40, 50 years if the planet mm -hmm. keeps warming. But anyway, uh, so we're coming to the end of my show and I just want to tell you that uh, I'm going to go, I'm going to go so people can see both of us here. Hello there. I just want to say that your career has been one of activism and action to provide education systems, visions and policies for a better future here on earth. And for that, I want to thank you and honor you. And I want to let you know that your work has been deeply and influential and important to me in the work that I've done. And I want to honor you for challenging me because there were times in my career where you would call me and say, hey, wait a minute, let's think about that. You know, and also I and I also know that you agree with me that uh, Act 250 and the permitting in Vermont is really important because without that, Vermont would look like other places that we would not want to live. So, and you've been really active in all of that. So to you, Diane Gayer, I honor you and I'm so glad you're my friend and I want to thank you for being on my show. And, and to my- Melinda, I miss seeing you more often. Yes. Well, maybe we need to plan to get together more often. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I, so, so actually I would love that. Yeah. And to my, and to my viewers, thank you for joining me today with Diane Gayer, and I will see you all soon.